Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Mentor Graphics with John Ferguson, who's going to talk today about silicon photonics. The concept of photonics and photonic signal processing has been around for a long time, for several decades, at least since the 80s. Um, but it hasn't really gained a lot of ground uh, for a couple reasons. One is, uh, traditionally, photonics processing requires a lot of exotic processes. Um, and exotic is, of course, a fancy word for expensive. Um, and like a lot of other things that look like they're promising, um, with the advances in Moore's Law that we've been able to see node over node over node, they became irrelevant. We could take uh, CMOS processing techniques with some modifications, move them forward very inexpensively, and, and move forward process very easily. Um, but now, as you know, Moore's Law is struggling to say the least. Um, you know, we're, we're not uh, getting the kinds of improvements that we need uh, in order to continue. Um, and so some of these techniques, like uh, photonics in general, become more interesting. Silicon photonics is particularly engineer, uh, interesting because it potentially offers us an economical way to bring photonics into the processing world that we're already familiar with. But before I go into that, I'll step back a little bit and t talk a little bit more about what is this conceptually so that we can understand how this is going to benefit us. So I'm going to start with, with basic high school physics first. When you have light, and it's blue for the light, when you have light coming through a medium and it comes to a surface of the medium, then two things can happen. One, the light can reflect back in on itself, or the light can refract out. And there's some simple laws in place that, that describe how this behaves, right? This is Snell's law. So the reflection part is easy. You're in the same medium, so your angle theta is going to be equal on both sides. Oops. Theta. Um, and so it, you know what's, what's going to happen. What comes out on the other side is dependent upon the difference in the dielectric constants between the two mediums. So here we have dielectric constant 1, and here we have dielectric constant 2. Um, and so the, the basic law is that N2 sine theta 2 which is here, is equal to n1 sine theta 1. Um, and so this is, this is kind of the you know, simple things that we all learn. This is why, for example, if you're looking down into a wishing well, the change on the bottom looks closer than it really is. Because the angle has changed, and your eye is perceiving it here, as opposed to where it really is over here. Okay, so that is good. Now, if we extend this a little bit further, we say, okay, I, I bring my light into something that has surface on, on all sides around it. Uh, so it's essentially enclosed. Now, some of this light's gonna, gonna reflect, 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 and some will refract. That amount that's going to refract is, of course, dependent upon the difference in these two dielectric constants. If we get to the point where we have uh, sine theta 1 is equal to n2 over n1 sine theta sine theta 2, something magical happens. This is what we call total internal reflection. It means none of it's going to refract. Everything stays internal to the material. So what you're talking about here is a very efficient way of reflecting light. Because nothing is getting yes. lost. Yes. So this, this has been in practice also for a long time. This is what makes the concept of a fiber optic possible. So if, if you remember, I, I don't know, maybe you're not as old as I am. I remember being young, making some calls to Europe. The phone calls were terrible. Quality was poor. You could barely hear. There was a long delay. Good chance you were going to be disconnected. 
Now you think about, you know, we have teleconferences to Europe, to China, three-way calls, and the quality is great. It's like you're in the same room. All because somebody took these fiber optics, buried them down at the bottom of the ocean, and now that signal is processing nearly unimpeded all the way. Um, and so it's, it's moving the speed of light as opposed to pushing electrons through a wire, which is, of course, much more difficult. So what does this mean in terms of chips? That's, that's a great question. So now, it just so happens that um, at a certain wavelength of light, which also happens to be the most commonly used wavelength for doing photonic signal processing, um, is used in most of the chips that control, for example, the, the fiber optics, um, it so happens that silicon is transparent at that wavelength. It also just miraculously happens that silicon oxide happens to have the almost exact N1 to N2 ratio so that we can get this, this uh, total internal reflection through silicon if it's surrounded by that silicon oxide. So this becomes really exciting. This means that I can now potentially pass signals very fast, with very low power, through silicon, where I also have, you know, lots of foundries and fabs all over the world that know how to make the silicon and silicon oxide type chips. So conceivably, it means we can take some of the learning that the CMOS world has been doing for years and apply it to this other technology very inexpensively and potentially reap all these rewards. And no heat comes out of this too, right? There's no leakage on any of that. For the most part, no. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's little bits. You, you never will get away from any of it, but uh, it's much, much less than in the in electronic world. There are, you know, of course, some trade-offs to this technologies as well. It's not a replacement for CMOS processing, for example. One of the biggest issues is that this is a great way to pass signals but it's not necessarily a great way to process a signal. Uh, you know, in a, in a waveguide, this is a, called a waveguide when you have this encapsulation. In a waveguide, it's, it's passive only. Um, and so in order to do some signal processing, you, you have to have some kind of electricity in electric circuits. Um, and so I, I can show you a little bit about uh, some basic photonic devices, which might make this clearer. And so let's say, let's say I have this waveguide and I've got some light passing through it. Now I want to do, I want to detect something on the other end based on, on some other behavior. Um, so how can, I, how can I manipulate this light? Well, in a simple passive way, the simplest thing I can do is a resonator. Uh, so a resonator looks something like this. Pardon my not so delicate oval shapes here. And now let's say I have another, another waveguide come in here. So what can we do with this? Let's imagine we have light coming in this direction. Remember from Snell's law, the the amount of light that can come out is dependent on the angle. So along here, I'm doing just great, no problems. But suddenly, I'm coming to these bends. How much light I lose here is dependent upon the angle that I'm going to have. So you have to model these curves very, very carefully. But if I model this very carefully, this light's going to, some of this light's going to come out into this ring. And it's going to circle around here. Similarly, some of this light here can leak in here. Now, how much and how far is going to depend not only on that angle, but how far away is this, right? Because this is, it's not quite uh, trans, uh, opaque, but it's translucent, and so the light's not going to go that far. If I want to block how much comes that way, I can do so on the input, right? I can make this, a, this side steeper and this a tighter curve so that it'll be uh, interfered on the other side and vice versa on this side. Now, depending upon the length of this track, 
how far it is versus the wavelength of this light, this guy is going to come around here and now some of it's going to bleed this way into this guy. These will interfere with each other. They could interfere constructively or destructively depending on the phase of each, right? So if I made this track just the right length so that now this is out of phase with that, I get destructive interference and I can detect that on this side. I can do something with it. If I put it so that they just happen to be in phase and I get stronger signal, I get an amplification and I can again do something with that. Is that controllable by the wavelength of light on what you're actually doing with that and how much your interference you're getting? It, it is controllable a bit to the wavelength of light, but you don't have full control through wavelength because, uh, again, the, if you change the wavelength, you're also changing the uh, dielectric constant behavior, right? And so if you dramatically change it, all of a sudden silicon looks like what you and I see in a silicon wafer. It looks like a piece of metal, right? It's no longer transparent. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful. But there are things you can do to further tune and manipulate these things. So there are, there are things that, yeah, I think I'll erase this. There, we'll talk a little bit about um, the difference between a photon and an electron, or a light and a particle, right? So if you remember your basic physics again, a photon is basically a wave. It has some momentum and some direction. Um, and if you really look at it, it has, it has two parts to it. There's the uh, electric part and the magnetic part, which are out of phase. Assume that that's the line and the red is coming in and out of the board. Um, <clears throat> now, the nice thing about light is there's not a lot that, that impacts it, right? I mean, it obviously it can't go through something that's, that's opaque, um, but it can reflect, it can reflect, refract, and there's little that, that impacts it, but there are some things that will impact it. A uh, strong electromagnetic field will obviously change the behavior of some of these, these waves. Um, also, heat and temperature change can impact uh, some of this stuff. Um, and so we're gonna use that. Uh, now, if you think about an electricity, it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, electricity, it's, it's actually a particle. A particle takes up space, it has mass, it's basically in the way. Um, they're very small particles, an electron or a hole that we're trying to move through a chip. They're, they're tiny, but they are physical and they have real physical impacts. Um, and so one of the problems we face as an industry right now, one of the big ones, is power. The power issue comes as a big percentage of the power is because we're taking these electrons and we're pushing them through very difficult convoluted channels, right? Because if I want to get from point A to point B, I, if I've got something in the way, I have to go up a via, over to another metal, down, up, down, left, right, sideways. I'm making all of these bends. Um, and these are all highly resistive materials. You've got capacitive effects, they're getting slowed down by your parasitics. Um, and so it means you have to push them harder and harder and harder, which means more power. Um, and it becomes expensive. Light, on the other hand, is very different. Uh, because very little affects it, you can send it through and it really just doesn't care. Um, the only things you don't want to do is you don't want to hit a brick wall because it's going to reflect back on itself. Um, so you have to have very gentle curves like we showed in that, that device example. Um, and you kind of really need to know exactly what are you doing with those curved structures to make sure that you're not going to bleed too much out only where you want them to, etc. Um, the other nice thing is one photon can exist in the same space and same time with another photon. Um, they don't even know they're there, right? They just co-mingling, it doesn't matter. So you can send potentially all kinds of different signals through the same waveguide at once.